Hello, Alex here, and in this video I want to talk about Kodak's D76, and by extension and to a lesser extent Ilford's ID11, black and white film developers, and what you need to know about them in terms of safety, handling, and disposal. This video is sponsored by the folks at thephotoshop.ie, who have partnered with me for this educational video and video series on photographic chemical safety. I'll talk more about them later, so for now, let's get into it. Before we start, I have to give a mandatory legal disclaimer. The opinions expressed within this video are my own professional and educated opinions, but they are just opinions and do not constitute legal advice on either beha the behalf of myself or the folks at thephotoshop.ie. I'll be happy to answer any general queries in the comments down below or by Instagram DM or email, but any pressing queries should be directed to your local council, uh, city or other regulatory board. As we go through, I'll give D76 a rating out of three in terms of safety, handling, disposal, and of course, cost, and then we'll tally those scores up at the end. First introduced in 1927 and then later refined and updated in 1975, D76 is an MQ type black and white film developer that reduces silver ions onto your latent image crystals, growing them during the development process into the actual metallic silver grains in your final negative. Along with HC110 and Rodinal, both of which I've spoken about previously during this series, D76, and again ID11 by extension, are essentially the third part of the holy trinity of black and white film developers, those being the closest thing to standards as you're probably going to get in black and white photography. Aside from being very common for home use, D76 and ID11 are extremely common and, at least in this part of the world, seem to be among or if not distinctly the most common option for labs to use for black and white film development. D76 is a one-part powder developer that you use to prepare a stock solution and the bags come in two sizes for either a 1 litre or 3.8 litre aka 1 US gallon stock solution. To make it up you take the bulk of your water at 50 to 55 degrees C, add in the powder, stir it until it's fully dissolved and then top it up to the required amount. It is very important that this water is actually 50 to 55 degrees Celsius because I misread it as 30 to 35 thinking that's slightly warm and it took over an hour of continuous stirring and occasionally topping it up with a little bit of boiling water to get it to dissolve. After you do that, you just leave it to sit for a day to make sure everything's fully dissolved, like fully, fully, and then you're good to go. This stock solution is then either used as is for replenishment or direct reuse, or diluted one to one, one plus two, one plus three, one plus two being much less common for one shot purposes. One of the few differences between ID11 and D76 is that ID11 is a two-part developer coming as two separate pouches that you have to dissolve one after the other. When you use the stock solution, D76 is quite a strong solvent developer due to its high sulfide content, and then when you use it at 1 plus 1 or 1 plus 3, it's a much weaker to completely non-solvent developer as you dilute the sulfide along with everything else. This means it's really useful for both cubic and tabular grain films, so your HP5 as well as your Delta, your Tri-X as well as your T-Max. An opinion I found online that really did surprise me when doing research for this video is that a lot of people think D76 and ID11 are just boring. I think people might be associating these developers with either their early home development and their presumably worst photography from years ago, or maybe bad lab scans from labs that happen to use D76. That might be some of it, but some of it is definitely just that people find the grain neither overly fine nor overly coarse, and the accutance and sharpness to be neither high or low respectively. It's quite neutral in some regards, with certain films that looks absolutely incredible. I personally adore Tri-X in ID11 D76. Some people just don't, and they don't find it interesting. As I said, D76 was updated essentially in 1975 with a new formulation. And from what I've read, I gather there are two differences between the old and new formulae. The old formula was a two-part developer, where the new one is a one-part developer, just a single packet, which is nice. And that the newer formulation helps solubilize one of the developers a lot better. Sodium sulfide at 85 to 90% makes up the majority of the contents in the bag. And I've spoken about this so many times now through this series, I'll just gloss over it. It has two main roles. It's an antioxidant preservative, preserving, preserving and lengthening the life of the stock solution after you've prepared it. And it acts as a solvent, solvent for the silver atoms in your developing grain, stripping silver atoms off of the sharp corners and the rough edges, 
just kind of smoothing and sphericalizing your grains, causing finer grain in your images at the cost of some sharpness and accutance. I also mentioned that D76 is an MQ type developer containing two developers, Metal or Metal and Hydroquinone. I don't know why it's called Q. Both are here at one to 5%. And these two are used together because they um, exhibit super additivity. That is that the speed of the mixture of the two is greater than the sum of their own respective speeds if used separately. And there are a few developer combinations that work in this way, but an MQ developer is the classic and most well-described type. Boric anhydride at 0.1 to 1% is a different thing from boric acid, and there is no clear answer about this, so the following is speculation. It may be an anti-caking agent, preventing the powder from clumping up over time, and this might be present because it's only a one-part developer versus a two-part developer like Xtol, ID11, and other such things. It's not 100% clear, and there are some forms where people speculate online about this role, but there's nothing concrete, so I won't say too much. Sodium tetraborate, or borax, at 0.1 to 1%, is an alkaline accelerator, which enhances the activity of your developers by raising the pH. Lastly, sodium hydroxide at 0 to 1% may also be here to increase the pH, but it could also be here because when you add boric anhydride to water, it hydrolyzes to release boric acid, which would drop the pH, and the sodium hydroxide might be there specifically to counteract that because it is a strong base itself. The official capacity for the stock solution is 4 rolls per litre, or 10 rolls per US gallon, the 3.8 litres and you can extend that with um, time compensation. There's a, I'll put a table on screen and you can probably get it up to 10 rolls per liter or 40 rolls per gallon if you're following Ilford's method. Th those are the numbers that they give for ID11. Kodak don't specifically give an upper recommended limit, so I'll leave that up to you. One thing to note is that even though this is a fairly concentrated stock solution, you must always have, I think it's like 235 to 250 milliliters of stock solution no matter what per roll. So if you were doing, say, um, a rotary process in a Jobo with a very small amount, like 80 to 100 mils, that is not enough developer to actually develop a roll of film, no matter what you do. The capacity at one plus one is two rolls per liter or eight rolls per gallon. And although that, you know, if you need a quarter of a liter to do one roll, half a liter to make up one liter of one plus one should be enough to do two rolls of film. Kodak actually say that's not even a good idea without extending the time. You, if you do two rolls at once, at one plus one, and it should be at the same time, not in sequential runs, because it will die that quickly, you need to extend your development time by 10% to compensate for the reduction in effective development power. At one plus three, it is strictly one shot for one roll of film, and you get one roll per liter or four rolls per gallon. There is or was a replenisher called D76R that Kodak do or used to sell that you could use to extend the lifetime of your stock solution, mainly for use in labs. But there are some people saying it was discontinued in 2017 and I reached out to the Sino Promise group who for reasonably obvious reasons have not gotten back to me to clarify whether or not it's still available. The shelf life of an unopened intact bag of D76 is functionally like a billion years. Your family line is probably going to end before this stuff goes bag, again if the packaging is intact. Oxidation of powders is essentially, it's not, not a thing, but it's, you know, it occurs on such an incredibly long time scale that if the package is sealed, I wouldn't be worrying about it. Kodak say that the stock solution is officially good for six months in a full tightly sealed bottle or two months in a partially sealed bottle. I made up this stock solution 10 months ago and it's still good. This is the last one liter bottle and I've done my clip test, it is fine. Kodak's data sheet officially says blank for the one plus one working solution in terms of shelf life and that makes sense because if they recommend developing for longer when using two rolls in a liter of a one plus one, probably is dying while you're developing just from being more dilute. These kind of oxidation things take place a lot more quickly when things are more dilute. A quick reminder here that the SDS refers to the product as you receive it, not as you use it. So in this case, we're talking about the risks associated with the powder, not the stock solution that, or the working solutions that you prepare from that stock solution. The stock is quite concentrated though, despite needing, you know, like a quarter ish of a liter to develop one roll of film but it's still significantly safer than the powder itself 
in terms of its toxicity because you are diluting it relatively quite a bit. Section two tells us quite a lot. It tells us that it is corrosive, extremely toxic to aquatic life, acutely a toxic if ingested, a germ cell mutagen, meaning that it can cause mutations that are passed on in your sperm or eggs to your children directly, that it's carcinogenic and that repeated exposure can cause kidney damage or blood damage. This is not particularly nice stuff. Section four is largely boilerplate with the three key elements that stand out that I want to go over. Firstly, is that it can in fact cause blindness. This is again, the powder, but it's not just about the amount. It's that it's very easy to aerosolize the D76 dust into the air. And that dust can end up in, you know, the, the moisture on the surface of your eyes and that can cause damage. So you don't have to splash the powder into your eyes. You can just get a bit of dust in the air, which can damage your eyes from there. The second is that it can cause and does cause allergic skin reactions, rashes and edema. And the third is that prolonged exposure causes chronic health effects. Aside from the various things mentioned already, uh, the meat hall is a sensitizer. And that means that prolonged repeated exposure can make you react worse to it over time. A lot of modern developers try to emulate the MQ super additive formulation without using meat hall. These are things like Ilfosol 3, uh, Microfen and HC110 that use phenidone and other phenidone derivatives as a substitute for the metal or metal, however it's pronounced. Section six says about what we would expect, clean up small spills of the powder with a damp towel, at least for our purposes. And even if you spill the full pack, I would kind of just like with a dust mask, uh, brush it up and then make up a solution or, you know, throw it in a bucket and then dispose of it as a liquid because that's going to be a lot easier than dealing with the powder. Section eight talks about the maximum safe levels of each component in the air. And although these are quite high, they could be achieved relatively easily if you were to disperse those fine dust particles up into the air. It does recommend using not just basic PPE like eye protection and gloves, but also an apron to protect your clothes because the dust could stick into your clothing fibers as well as like ventilation protection. A dust mask will be fine. Personally, I wear my, one of my lab coats, safety specs over my glasses, gloves and a dust mask when I'm making D76, aside from the B-roll for this video. And when I'm working with the stuff, the actual working solution, I do make sure to wear my lab coat. I don't own an apron, so I just use the lab coat instead. Toxicologically speaking, section 11 mainly breaks down two things. The first is that exposure to extreme heat, 260 degrees or above, not a factor for us, or strong acids, potentially a factor for us, stop bath, could result in the liberation of sulfur dioxide gas. Unfortunately, I know what SO2 smells like, so I made up, or I did a dev run where I used the stock solution, deliberately didn't shake it all out when I emptied the tank and then dumped in double strength Ilfo stop, just to get, you know, a more concentrated acid solution into a very concentrated D76 residual solution, you know, res residual drops within the tank. There was nothing. So I think on home scale, it's safe to say that's not going to be a problem. The second thing is that it does break down the certain effects that asthmatics and sulfite sensitive people can suffer when exposed to the dust. It also does say a little bit about the specifics regarding cancer and the like, but there's not enough detail for me to say anything terribly descriptive here. So you can just pause it and read through it if you want. The safest way to deal with the powder and actually make up your stock solution without spreading the powder through the air is to wear long gloves like dedicated dish gloves that you only use for your darkroom chemicals and put the entire bag into that starting portion of water, like in my mop bucket and cut the bag underwater and empty it out under the water. Then you're not spreading any dust in the air whatsoever. And you can just cut the bag open and rinse it a bit. And then, you know, everything has gone into the stock solution. That is the safest way to do it. And I didn't do it for the B roll for this video, just so I could make a point and draw your attention to it. As much as I like it, I'm gonna have to give D76 a one out of three for safety. There are quite a few risks associated with both the powder in practical sense, as well as the stock solution and its long-term effects that you could you know, potentially uh, accumulate or suffer as your exposure continues over time. Apart from opening the bag uh, underwater to avoid the dusting issue, there's not a lot you can really do to prevent the effects, only protect yourself from them. So yeah, one out of three seems fair, unfortunately. 
This will be the shortest handling section in the series so far. Section 7 and Section 10 both say absolutely nothing I've not already mentioned. What I will say instead is that in terms of handling, you need to be quite vigorous and random with your agitation when you're working with this stuff. Unlike a lot of developers like Rodenal or Extol, which are okay with swizzle stick agitation, as I've mentioned in my previous video developing Rollei IR400 in a few different developers, D76 does not like that. You will get horrible, horrible surge marks if you try swizzle stick agitation, and even if you use uh, inversion agitation and you're mostly kind of rocking it back and forth, you're gonna get some kind of a surge mark some of the time. And the only way to really prevent that is to use very random like figure eight almost agitations where you're constantly changing the direction. It's something to bear in mind that it's a, a little bit less of a mindless operation handling this stuff when it's in the tank than it is with a lot of other developers. Just something to bear in mind and it's not super relevant to the handling section, I'm kind of forcing it, but I wanted to actually say something relevant and hopefully useful. The capacity of the developer is well known, well described, and it's relatively small, so it's an easy number to keep track of. It's a lot easier to keep track of going between rolls 6 and 8 than rolls 36 and 38, in my opinion. Handling the stock solution and the working solutions is fine. They're not overly viscous, they don't fizz or anything, there are no weird smells coming off them it's pretty easy to handle. But I do have to knock a point off for the powder in terms of handling it and preparing that. It's just awkward and you can't split powders very well. That's not something we've had to talk about before. It's not really reliable. Where you could easily split a bottle of HC110 with a friend, you can't really split D76 without making the stock solution. So again, it's not completely mindless in terms of how you use it. So two out of three for handling. Section 12 breaks down just how toxic this is to aquatic life in powder form again, and the answer is, uh, very. Mainly from the hydroquinone. It's probably also due to the methyl, but that doesn't seem to be as well studied, so the figures aren't here. Section 13, again talking about the powder, says don't pour it down the drain, don't allow it to enter waterways, and do arrange for professional chemical disposal. Again, 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 that's for the powder, not the stock solution or your working solution. Kodak themselves in a 1999 document recommend home developers just all mindlessly going down the drain. Now, standards change and that is nearly 25 years ago at this stage, but I would say if you dilute your stock maybe down to 1 plus 15, 1 plus 20, and then dispose of it portion wise, you can probably fairly mindlessly stick it down the drain once you're done with it. Something I do is I actually add 50 milliliters to 100 milliliters of your typical 5% sodium hypochlorite bleach into each liter of used um, D76. And I only use it stock or one plus one personally, so it's easy to keep track of that. That will oxidize both the hydroquinone to parabenzoquinone and the metal to its corresponding iminium thing. I don't wanna to go too deep into the chemistry, but that will react with water and break down into quinone, which is not great, but is slightly better in terms of its environmental impact. So you're forcibly oxidizing and destroying the methyl to make the overall solution a little bit better. I don't know how much that really helps, but it definitely helps to a non-zero amount, and that cheapo bleach costs, what, like a euro for five liters? So yeah, it's not really, it's no skin off my back. If you do that, it is important to note that it can generate quite a bit of heat, especially depending on the scale you work at, and it could potentially give off chlorine vapors, so do it outside. So D76 is another, don't just mindlessly pour it down the drain thing, but it's okay if you do it in the right way kind of chemical. So for that reason, it gets a two out of three for disposal. A bag of D76 to make up one gallon or 3.8 liters costs 12 euros. A packet of ID11 to make up 5 litres costs 20 euros. So assuming their capacities are actually indeed the same as some people online say, most people say use it one shot and throw it away, stop worrying about it, but if the people who do talk about capacity are correct, then you're talking about D76 being about 20% cheaper than ID11, at least here in this part of the world today. Realistically, it's a lot more expensive than something like Rodenal and even HC110, but it's significantly less expensive than a lot of the stronger solvent developers that the stock D76 kind of competes with, like Ilfosol, 
uh, non-replenished Extol, certainly DDX, which is the gold standard for expensive darkroom chemicals, at least developers, it sits somewhere in the middle and by using the whole time replenishment thing you can get a bit more out of it, so I think a 2 out of 3 is fair. Before I tally up the scores, I of course have to give a huge shout out and thanks to the folks at thephotoshop.ie who again have partnered with me for this educational video and video series on photographic chemical safety. They're a pleasure to deal with and their catalogue is always growing. With the rising cost of colour film, one of the most common ways people are trying to combat that is shooting vision film, and this shows by how many companies are repackaging and re-spooling the vision films these days. The problem with those is developing them, and a lot of the labs around this part of the world, and certainly in general, don't do ECN2 development, so you're kind of stuck doing it at home. Thankfully, the folks at the Photoshop have recently started stocking Bellini ECN2 development kits, as well as the Remjet remover if you would like to just use that and develop it in C41 chemistry. Even if you aren't looking at the world of vision chemistry and bulk rolling and all this kind of thing, they've recently also started stocking the Bellini E6 slide development kit, which is something I am very interested to try in the near future. Thanks again to the folks at thephotoshop.ae, and now we'll tally up the scores. Codex D76 gets a 1 out of 3 for safety, 2 out of 3 for handling, 2 out of 3 for disposal, and 2 out of 3 for cost, for a total score of 7 out of 12. D76 is a standard for a reason. It's highly versatile, usable for just about any type of black and white film, and you can balance your sharpness and grain in pretty much any way you want by using it stock or diluted somewhere along that spectrum. It's definitely got some safety risks associated with it, but a little bit more PPE than you're normally used to is just enough to overcome that. And in terms of the agitation thing, changing your method is not the worst thing in the world and more thorough and random agitation is a good thing realistically for all developers, even if other developers are not as prone to surge marks and the other associated problems as these developers are. Although I have focused on D76 in this video, this is functionally the ID11 video as well because they are so similar, I'm not going to be doing a dedicated ID11 video. It just wouldn't make sense. That is all I have to say about Codex D76 today, so stay safe and bye bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at shaka1277 for new pictures every day. If you like this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.